Good morning. Today we're going to talk about John chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. And, and again, I mean, this is a very familiar story and contains one of the most well-known and probably well-loved verses in the Bible in John three sixteen. But before I get to that point of it, <clears throat> excuse me, John, it, this begins with, Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews who came to Jesus by night. And he, he says this to Jesus, Jesus, teacher, rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one could do the signs that you do apart from God. And so here the gospel writer, John, puts this word sign right into Nicodemus' conversation. And what's a sign? I mean, we're, we're driving the car, vehicle down the road, and we see a speed limit sign, we see a stop sign, a yield sign, uh, an informational sign, you know, that tells us our destination is so far away, but signs lead us and guide us and, you know, just, you know, give us information and, and inform us of what's going on. And, and so this is, you know, John uses that word in his gospel several times, you know, that it's, this was the first sign of Jesus, the turning the water into wine, and I've mentioned that word, but, you know, so, Nicodemus, one of the, the leaders of the, of the Pharisees, that remember what they would call the Sanhedrin, comes to Jesus with a title of respect, rabbi, teacher, showing that he understands and he's been listening to Jesus and he, he knows that, that, that this teaching that Jesus has, this method of explaining things in, in a new manner, has to be from God because no one, no one has been able to do the things that Jesus has been able to do. And, and granted, like I said yesterday, the turning the water into the wine at the Cana is the only miracle so far that John has told us about. But according to, you know, he did say many other things that Jesus has done, many other signs. So they've been watching him and they've been seeing him and Nicodemus comes to learn more. And another thing about the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin was made up of 71 people. Why? Because remember way back in, uh, in Book of Numbers, Moses, the leader of the people, having led them out of captivity. Um, and everybody comes to him with all of their problems, all of their concerns and everything, and Moses is just worn out with it all. And his father-in-law, Jethro, says, well, why don't you select some more people to help? And Moses selects 70 people. So there, so you have Moses and the 70 makes up what would be the Sanhedrin in Jesus' day. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then <clears throat> I had never thought about this before this morning, but there's a time that it tells us that, you know, Jesus sent out his disciples two by two, but also the sending of the 70. So Jesus utilized this same method that you know that Moses did with the 70 plus you know the himself and the 70 that he sent out again it's that it's that number and we, we so so often we find numbers of with importance in the bible seven is a sign of completion you know six is is not and you know 40 days and 40 nights how many times do we see and hear that you know but anyway uh I just thought I'd share those numbers with you and because you know Jesus is is a devout Jew I mean he knows how many are in the Sanhedrin he knows these different things that way and and he understands that as Nicodemus comes <clears throat> one of the members of this Sanhedrin that Nicodemus is a man of some importance he's got some sway in the community and and Nicodemus, you know, talks to Jesus. And we know the story of being born again. And, and it's, you know, we, you know, we are born in the flesh. When we are born into this world, we come into the world with flesh and blood and breath in us. And, and when we are baptized or dedicated to God, we are, you know, we are then born of the Spirit. And, and this is, you know, this, this kind of prefigures Jesus' conversation, the, the, the baptism. And, you know, and Jesus has been baptized by John. John has been going around pro proclaiming and 
doing the baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. And <clears throat> so it is being born of the Spirit, being born from above, you know, uh, and it's being born anew. I mean, we, we can't be reborn, but Jesus is talking figuratively about the the spirit coming to life within us and everything else. <clears throat> and then, um, I'm just, I'm going to spend a little bit of time, well, before we get to the John three sixteen, you know, Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And so the, the sign of the serpent, if you don't remember, uh, there were there were snakes and, and things that were biting people and they were poisonous and people were dying. And they prayed to God to take away the snakes. But rather than to take the snakes away, God had Moses make this pole and with the form of a serpent on it. And if they looked up to the serpent on the pole, they were healed. And, and to this day, you know, the physician's symbol is a serpent on a pole, you know, the, the healing that comes that way. And it's, it's a reminder for us that, you know, God isn't going to take all of our troubles away from us, but he's going to find help, find a way and help us through those issues and everything going on. And so here in, you know, verse, verse 315 is, you know, whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then, and then we come with that most well-known, you know, for, 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 God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life, or his only begotten son. Or there's, you know, different versions of it, but it's that reminder that, you know, Jesus is saying to Nicodemus and to each and every one of us that, that just as, you know, the people looked up at the serpent on the pole that Moses created for healing, we too look to the cross, to the empty cross, where Jesus was crucified for, for the promise of, of resurrection to new life, for the promise of forgiveness of sins, for all of that. And, and as important as John 3.16 is, the, the last two verses we look at today have at least as much importance. You know, verse 17, Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world would be saved through him. So, I mean... It, kind of saying the same thing in a few different words. So we've had verse 15, that whoever believes in him will not have eternal life. Verse 16, whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17, that the world would be saved through him. You know, so there we have three verses in a row that talk about our salvation and how people are saved. <clears throat> and And it's that, it's that promise that comes from God, you know, and, and it's, you know, I, I just love that statement that Jesus says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn us, but to save us. And, you know, and, and we can, you know, we point fingers at, you know, that's just wrong. You know, we kind of wiggle our fingers sometimes at people even, you know, when this is wrong, but <clears throat> Jesus didn't come just to point a finger and condemn us. He may point the finger and say, what you're doing is wrong. And he does that to, to many people. You know, he says, um, your, your sins are forgiven. Go on your way, you know, and sin no more is one of the things he says, you know, to that woman caught in adultery. But we are to, we are to be changed by our encounter with God. The last verse again now is, is another real important one. And a friend of mine said, you know, people really need to know this. And I agree. Jesus says, those who believe in him are not condemned. So those who believe in Jesus are not condemned. But those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the only Son of God. So here, I mean, in these three verses, you know, we call John 3, 16, the gospel in a nutshell, and it is. But verse 317 <clears throat> is just that reminder that, that God didn't send Jesus to condemn us, but to forgive us, to, to save us. And then verse 18, for those who believe, there is no condemnation, you know, and, and Paul writes that in, in or, you know, and we see that in the book of Romans, you know. There is therefore now no condemnation 
for those who believe in Jesus Christ, you know, and, and it is such a powerful thing. You know, those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already. And, and it, it's just one of those reasons for you and for me to, to try to help share the word of God, you know, and, and, and you know, where a lot of us are uncomfortable ah, thinking about that. But it's just, you know, it's simply in the way we live and the way we treat others and, and the way we come about being who we are in the world today. So these verses, this conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus is one that, you know, many parts of it are so well known. You know, how can one be born again? And then, of course, you know, whoever believes will have eternal life. And that's, that's the Christian church that, you know, believing in Jesus is salvation.